honored to have as our weekend camp meeting speaker, Pastor Randy Roberts, pastor of the Loma Linda University Church, a church that is probably the largest Seventh-day Adventist church in the North American division of over 6,000 members. On Thursday night, Pastor Roberts indicated that more than anything else, this weekend he wanted to uplift Jesus before God's people. And so we saw in that question that was asked of us, who do you say that Jesus is to you? And last night as he opened the Gospel of Mark, he talked about how Jesus longs to heal us from our pain through friends that he provides for us and through his marvelous forgiving spirit. And he asks us to emulate that in our lives as friends and as forgiving people. Today, as he opens God's word, let's join together as we ask God's blessing upon him. And let's ask God, as we have done each evening and at each meeting, to open our hearts to be receptive to his word. Father in heaven, this is your Sabbath day, and we have come as your people to worship you. And now your servant messenger stands before us to open the word of the living God. And as Pastor Randy Roberts opens your word, may Jesus be lifted up. For we pray this and ask for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to receive this. And therefore we pray together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me. Sometimes life gets scary. A hospital administrator was walking down the hallway near the operating suite. Suddenly the door burst open and a patient, trailing lines, hospital gown, ran out down the hallway. The administrator caught him and stopped him. The man's eyes were wide. He was clearly terrified. What is wrong? It's the nurse. It's what the nurse said. What did she say? She said, just take a deep breath. Breathe slowly. There's no problem. It's just an appendectomy. And the administrator said, well, what's wrong with that? What's frightening about that? He said, she wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the doctor. <laughs> Sometimes life gets scary. Did you read the story? Story about the man on his way home late at night, decided he would cut across the cemetery, a quicker path home, a bit Daunting, but nevertheless, he'd be home sooner. Did not realize that right in his pathway lay a freshly dug, empty grave. He stumbled, fell, wham, into the bottom. He jumped, 
He clawed, he screamed, he yelled for help, couldn't get out. Finally exhausted, he resigned himself to his fate for the night and slunk into the corner and sat down to wait out the night. A second man, unaware of the first, (laughs) took the same path, crossed the cemetery, stumbled when? He jumped, he clawed, he screamed, he yelled. Finally exhausted, he paused for breath. When he heard a voice from the darkness say, You can't get out. (laughs) Well, guess what? He did. (laughs) Sometimes life gets scary. The thunderstorm was worthy of the Carolinas. The clap of thunder, the flash of lightning, it was too much for the child. He shouted and called for Mommy, who came running. He said, Mommy, this is, is the world ending? This is so scary. She tried to comfort him. She stroked his head, gave him words of reassurance. The house is strong. The rain will fall. The day will come. Nothing was enough. She finally got up to go back to bed, and he said, But Mommy, Mommy, sleep with me. She said, Honey, I've got to go back and sleep with Daddy. He said, the big baby. (laughs) Sometimes life gets scary. Have you bumped up against that reality? In a post-9-11 world, it is increasingly intense. Everywhere we look, on every hand, every news program, every newspaper, every news site, proclaims that simple reality, sometimes life gets scary. The fears have changed over the years. I I found one site, I don't know all of their sources, but I found one site that said about three or four decades ago, the five greatest fears reported by grade school children were animals, darkness, high places, strangers, and loud noises. Three or four decades ago, says the source. Today, it says, five greatest fears, divorce, nuclear holocaust, cancer, pollution, being mugged. Sometimes life gets scary. The darkness looms and uncertainty rises and lingers like bile at the back of our throat. Sometimes life gets scary. Sometimes it's the mere pace of life. The doctor has told us you're going to slow down or you're going to get slowed down permanently. You cannot continue to live this pace of life and expect to be okay, expect to be healthy. It's reflected in the verse that I found entitled, The Time of the Mad Adam. This is the age of the half-read page and the quick hash and the mad dash. The bright night with the nerves tight, the plane hop with the brief stop. The lamp tan in a short span, the big shot in a good spot, and the brain strain and the heart pain and the cat naps till the spring snaps and the fun's done. Isn't that the age in which we live? Sometimes life gets scary. Sometimes it's the fears that arise within us, the uncertainty, the panic. Sometimes it's the threats and the dangers that lurk outside of us. Psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists record that the number one treated disorder in America is anxiety-related disorders. We're a frightened people. We're unsure of what the future holds in America today. And so we look for some way to solve the fear. We look for some manner in which to hold the fear at bay. How do we deal with it? How do we control it? I ran across one person, Pamela Petler, who says, here's what you need to do. If you are stressed out and frightened, she says, eat the stress diet. 
It'll help. Breakfast, half a grapefruit, one piece of whole wheat toast, eight ounces of skim milk. Lunch, four ounces of lean broiled chicken veggie breast, one cup of steamed zucchini, one Oreo cookie, and herb tea. Mid-afternoon snack, the rest of the package of Oreo cookies, a quart of Rocky Road ice cream and a jar of hot fudge. Dinner, two loaves of garlic bread, a large mushroom pizza, a large pitcher of root beer, three Milky Ways, and an entire frozen cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer. And then you will have your heart stop. But those are the kinds of things for which we reach. Some way to solve, some way to resolve the fear within us. One more. This one, if you're frightened at home and don't know how to keep the threats out there at bay, how to install a wireless security system in four easy steps. One, go to a secondhand store, buy a pair of men's used work boots, a really big pair. Two, put them outside your front door on top of a copy of Guns and Ammo magazine. <laughs> Three, put a dog dish beside it, a really big dog dish. And four, leave a note on your front door that says something like, Bubba, Big Mike and I have gone to get more ammo. Be back in a half hour. Don't disturb the pit bulls. They've just been wormed. <laughs> I suppose that would keep people at bay. But we recognize, we understand that all those attempts are only half answers. They don't resolve the deeper fears. They don't help us deal with the fears that lurk at night, that leave us staring at the ceiling. Fears about job, about money, about health, about children, about future, and yes, for some, even about eternity. Sometimes life gets scary. How do we deal with our fear? I want to take you to a passage of Scripture this morning, a passage found in John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. Before we read the passage, I want to set the stage, because if there is any time in the Gospel of John, if there is any time in the Gospel's period in which life has gotten scary, this would top the list. It is night. The darkness has fallen, but the darkness is not sufficient to hide the roiling storm clouds that bear down upon this small group. They have gathered together. They are huddled around a low slung table, rough hewn. They are there with their master and their teacher. They are there while recognizing that outside the doorways, danger threatens. The enemies gather and plan and scheme. They recognize that something evil this way comes. They must have known that in their master there was something different tonight than there had been at any point before. They must have sensed within him a heaviness of soul. His words tonight seem more somber. His demeanor, his face, more filled with a sense of what is to come. A foreboding lingers in the air. As he begins to speak to them, the gravity of his words serves to underline, serves to highlight the fact that something dark and sinister is abroad. The passage we will read is a well-known passage. If you happen to have a red-letter edition Bible, you will notice that much of this section of Scripture appears in red because much of it is the words of Jesus. There aren't recorded questions in the account that the disciples have, but as I have read, as I have studied this account, I have concluded that much of what Jesus says is answering their questions. They're unasked. They're unvoiced questions, but questions that must have lingered in the air. 
Read the passage with me, John 14, the first four verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. In my growing up years, our family would gather for worship. And on occasion, my dad would say, what we're going to do tonight is just go around the circle and each of us repeat a Bible verse. Us kids always hoped we were first. And we would race for that verse, Jesus wept. <laughs> Shortest in Scripture, and we were done. But time and again, when it came time for my mother's verse, this was her verse. Wasn't the only one she repeated, but very commonly. She would repeat those words so that when I read them now, even to this day, it's as though I can hear my mother speak. Let not your hearts be troubled. In those elegant, inimitable words of the old King James, ye believe in God, believe also in me. It brought comfort to my heart and soul even as a child. Imagine the comfort that must have come on that dark night. I would suggest to you that with these words, Jesus speaks to the unspoken fears of the disciples, answers the unasked questions that were in their hearts. Put yourself in their seats, in their sandals. What might you have asked? What might I have asked? I think the first question that would arise, the most natural question that would come would be, Jesus, what do we do with our fear? What do we do with our fear? They have known fear before. They have known fear on the lake. They have known fear as the storm clouds burst upon them, as the waves crashed into the boat. They've known fear before, but they know it in a special way tonight. It would seem to me that that would be the most obvious question. Jesus, what do we do with our fear? And Jesus answers in one word, trust. Amen. Trust. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus, what do we do with our fear? He says, you trust. Amen. That, let's be honest, that is the hardest thing to do when we're frightened. The most difficult choice to make is the choice to trust. You see, when fear strikes, most of us want to not trust, but control. Get control of the situation. Try to control the circumstances, control the environment, control the people, control the ones who threaten us. That's what we want to do. In fact, unless I miss my guess, you know a person in your life that handles their inner fears in that way. You know him, you know her as a very controlling person. Listen to the words of Christian psychologist H. Norman Wright. Wright writes, have you met anyone who comes across as domineering and controlling? If so, you've encountered someone motivated by fear. Controlling people strive for the appearance of being in control, but inwardly they live in fear. Many of them feel that they cannot control their own feelings, so they attempt to control the way other people feel. They desperately want others to love them, but it's risky for controllers to give others the choice to love them because they may choose not to, so they demand love from others. 
What is it he says? If you have encountered someone who comes across as controlling and domineering, you have encountered someone who is controlled by fear. The last thing most of us want to do when we're frightened is trust. And yet if we ask Jesus, Jesus, what do we do with our fear? He says, trust. Trust God. Trust me. It sounds like the serenity prayer. You remember those words? Words apparently written by Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. Many of us pray that prayer in a different way as we seek to manage fear by control. We pray, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, me, courage to change the things I can, you, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's not trust. Trust means I relinquish. I invest myself, my life, my future into the hands of another. In this case, Jesus. We were in Mammoth Lakes, California. There for second or third time. I grew up in the tropics in the mission field and in Texas. We didn't snow ski. We did a lot of other sports, but snow skiing was not one of them. And so in my adult life, three or four decades in, here I was trying to learn how to snow ski. It was an utterly frightening experience. I pretty well mastered the slopes, though, the bunny slopes. I was trying to get the kids out of my way. Pizza, pizza, pizza. If you've ever snow skied, they tell you, make it look like a wedge and you'll get down the little bunny slope. So I decided, I'm going to try that bigger hill. And it was a bigger hill. It was quite a descent. I got up there and realized I had just a few minutes of life left. As I looked down that hill, I thought, there is no way I'm going down that. But there was no other way down. And so finally, I resolved it by taking long, slow swipes across the mountain. I would get across, be a few feet further down, and very gingerly get turned around and start down the other way. I couldn't look back. I knew people were coming, and they were flying past. Fortunately, they knew what they were doing, and so they would whip past and around me, and down they would go. And then I heard something behind me. I couldn't understand what it was at first. I just heard a masculine voice loud calling out in this slow cadence, this slow rhythm, left, right, left, right. I couldn't turn around at least not till I got off to the side and managed to turn around as they went by me with this gentleman still calling out, left, right. There were three of them, all dressed in orange jumpsuits, one in the front, one in the middle, one in the back. And they skied in an elegant cadence down the hill. They each wore a sign that said, blind skier. He was in the middle. No sight, just listening. Left, right, and down the mountain they went. Amen. Utter total trust. Jesus, what do we do with our fear? He says, trust. I think a second question loomed in the minds of the disciples, a question that is understandable when fear strikes, and that was the question, but Jesus, is there room for us in your plan? 
Do we fit into your plan? You seem preoccupied with other things this evening. We've heard the rumors around town. We've seen the enemies closing the circle. Is there room for us with you? And Jesus says, my father's house has plenty of room. In fact, I'm going to make a room with your name on the door. It's one of the deep fears we human beings have. In fact, some who study the human mind and the human experience say that one of the deepest fears we human beings experience is the fear of abandonment, the fear of being left, the fear that others will walk away and leave us alone. It's a fear we have even as toddlers. Walking around, learning to walk, learning to make some of our own way in the world to create a little distance. The toddler runs away from mommy, but then he always turns, makes sure she's there. Runs back, checks her out, feels her, she's real, toddles off again, and then checks, there's mommy. Don't forget me. Don't leave me. It's the child on the school bus that runs out and sees the school bus pulling away. Don't leave me. It's a deep fear of abandonment. The young man spoke about it by saying, we were deeply in love, the two of us, but the time had come for us to part ways, to go to our different colleges. They said it was puppy love, but it was real to the puppies. And there was great fear that somehow she would forget. And he says, and so we stood clinging to each other, saying that final goodbye. And he said, I said to her, don't forget me. I asked her, you won't forget, will you? There were those sincere, heartfelt, tearful promises made. I will not forget. And yet life came. It unfolded. And she forgot. And now he wept out his pain. It's one of our deepest fears. Another human being will leave us, forget us, no longer room for us in their plan. You may remember the ditty. It was years ago. I don't remember what phone company it was. In our part of the world, I think it was Southwestern Bell. And they used to advertise it by saying, long distance is the next best thing to being there. Do you remember that? It was that assurance. I remember a rather bitter young man who said to me, no, long distance is not the next best thing to being there. Next best thing to being there is somebody that looks like me. She forgot. It's a profound fear we feel, the fear of being left out, the fear that the popular kids will draw the circle and we will be on the outside, the fear that we will not be part of the in crowd, the fear that we won't belong at this church, the fear that we will be forgotten when the list is made for the party, for the dinner, for the vacation. The fear of abandonment. Jesus, is there room for us in your plan? I remember a grade school, eighth grade class. I was an eighth grader at the time. A small school, one of those schools where the teacher has several grades in one room. We were the eighth grade class. We were going to graduate that year. Five of us, four boys, one girl. From the vantage point of adulthood, I look back with deep regret. Kids can be cruel. I was cruel. 
I've often wished I would encounter her again. I have no idea where the journey of life has taken her. But I can tell you this. The four of us boys banded together and left her out. I've wished for her to come up somewhere at my church, at a camp meeting in the Carolinas, somewhere, and to say I was that girl. Because I would say, I am so sorry. We left you out. It must have been profoundly lonely. I am deeply sorry. Because I recognize from the vantage point of adulthood that one of the deepest pains is being forgotten, pushed aside, left out. It's one of the deepest human fears. Maybe that's why over and again through Scripture in both Old Testament and New, God moved upon the authors to record His words time and again in different ways, but always the same message. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You are not alone. And here on this seminal night, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I will not forget you. There is plenty of room in my Father's house. Deep fears. What do we do with our fear? You trust. Is there room for us in your plan? Plenty of room. I think there's a third question the disciples ask. It's a question for reassurance. We hear what you've just said, Jesus, but don't be frustrated with us, but there's still one more we must press home. Are you sure you won't forget us? Are you sure you will remember us? And Jesus says, I will not forget. I will come again. And I will receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be as well. I will not forget. It's a deep reassurance. The reassurance that says no matter what may happen in life, no matter what twists and turns may come, no matter what ups and downs may unfold, we will not be forgotten. We will always be remembered that there is a home where the door will always open, the light will always be on in the hall, and our own will welcome us. It happened in the presidency of Abraham Lincoln in what must have been deeply dark hours as this country was torn into by that civil war. Brother against brother, father against son, friends on opposite end of gun barrels. As the country was being ripped to shreds. That tall, angular man that president who must have been profoundly lonely. Could there be a lonelier presidency than one's own country being ripped to shreds? It was a different day and time in Washington, D.C. It was a day and time that even though it had its guards and its military, the president was much more accessible then than now. And it was then that a young man young, maybe mid-twenties, thirty, came to Washington, D.C. and knocked on the door asking to be given an audience with the president. I know him. He's my friend from back home in Springfield. I want to talk to the president. 
almost incredibly, incredibly, he was given an audience. I want you to listen how the author Keith W. Jennison describes the story Billy would later tell. The story Billy would tell of sitting with President Abraham Lincoln and talking together. Billy records Jennison said, we talked and talked. He asked me about Pritt and I, everybody in Springfield. I just let loose and told him about the weddings and the births and the funerals and the buildings. I guess there wasn't a yarn I'd heard in the three and a half years he'd been away that I didn't spend for him. Laugh? You ought to have heard him laugh. Just did my heart good. Because I could see what they'd been doing to him. Always was a thin man, but Lord, he, he was thinner than ever now. And his face was drawn and gray. It was enough to make you cry. Later that evening, Billy said goodbye, writes Jennison. The president tried to get him to stay the night, but Billy, not wanting to impose, declined. As they parted, Lincoln said, Billy, what did you come down here for? Well, I came to see you, Mr. Lincoln. But you haven't asked me for anything, Billy. What is it? Out with it. No, Mr. Lincoln. I just wanted to see you. Felt kind of lonesome. Been so long since I'd seen you, I was afraid I'd forget some of them yards if I didn't unload them soon. Lincoln gazed into his friend's eyes. Do you mean to tell me? You came all the way from Springfield, Illinois, just to have a visit with me? That you have no complaints in your pockets, no advice up your sleeve? Yes, sir, that's about it. Tears came into Lincoln's eyes and ran down his cheeks. I'm homesick, Billy, just plum homesick. And it seems as if this war will never end. Many a night I can see the boys dying in the fields and hear their mothers crying for them at home. And I can't help it, Billy. You'll never know. You'll never know just how much good you have just done me. Amen. Just to know we're not forgotten. Jesus, will you forget us? And he says, never. Never. Every time my reflection in the sea of glass shows me the scars. Every time my heart beats in my spear-riven side. Every time I see your prince in my palm, I will remember. I will remember you until the day I come to sweep you into my embrace. Sometimes life gets scary. Jesus, what do we do with our fear? He says, you trust. But Jesus, is there room for us in your plan? Plenty of room. You sure you won't forget us? I will not forget. I will come to receive you to myself. I think there's one question left, though. Just one last question. I, 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 I am sure the disciples had this question because I have it. When I think of my questions and I hear his answers, I'm sure they must have asked it. And that is this, Jesus. When I hear all of that, I have to ask, how do I receive that? How do I get all that you have just promised? How? You know what Jesus says? He says, you know the way. Amen. You know the way. He said, but I, I don't even know where you're going. How am I supposed to know the way? 
Isn't that what Philip asked? Do you remember Jesus' answer? Jesus says, I am the way. I am very poor with directions. Very poor. It was a good day when they invented GPS. <laughs> Although for many years my GPS has been named Anita. My dearly beloved is very good with directions. I get lost. I, I, I may get lost on the way back to the room. <laughs> I get lost. Time and again, though, when I have had the wisdom to listen, Anita has gotten there. At times she said, well, go here and go there. And, no, 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 no. Let me just get in the car. And when she gets in the car and sits right there and goes with me, she becomes the way. Jesus says, I am the way. There's a pastor who tells the story about one of his parishioners dying with cancer. He said, we would often go and visit her. We would try to comfort her. We would try to encourage her. And yet time and again, we left encouraged. She was a woman who had committed much scripture to memory. It now became her hope, her comfort, her stay, her strength as she would recite those passages. But there was one in particular. It was that passage out of Timothy. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. As her life ebbed away, as the sun sank on the western horizon of her path, she began to forget and began to struggle and began to only remember pieces. The pastor said, as I would go back, those memories would become more and more brief. I know in whom I have believed, am persuaded, keep what I've committed to him. Know whom I have believed the next time. Keep to him. Each time it got shorter. And then he said, the end came. As we huddled around, she only remembered one word, but she said it over and over again. Him. 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 At the end, it was all that she had left, and it was all she needed. Amen. Gracious God, sometimes life gets scary. The news, the neighbors, those fears that arise within us. And we frankly at times wonder what to do. Lord, let us know that when life gets scary, what we truly need, what we ultimately need, and all we really need is Him. In Jesus' name, amen.